Hello! We're just going to give this a second while participants join us. Welcome to the Wingnut Social uh, webinar, the second in our series here with Stacy Martin. Today's presentation is going to be somewhat life-changing. <laughs> and I'm serious. I've seen the deck and I have gotten feedback from people who have heard Stacy's episode, uh, episode number 250 of the Wingnut Social podcast, uh, that have changed their interior design presentations with her recommendations. So there you go. Let me see if I can see my video here. Alicia, can you see me okay? I'm not able to see if, make sure I'm coming across. Yes, I can see oh, you. Okay, great. All right. And everybody can hear me okay? Yes. All right. Um, just a couple of things before we get started. Thank you. A couple of things before we get started with Stacy Martin. I just want to say welcome to everybody, to the uninitiated who are unaware of who the hell Wingnut Social is. We are a digital marketing agency for interior designers, architects, adjacent verticals, and by adjacent verticals that's just a fancy way to say general contractors or anyone really in the home shelter space. We do SEO, full service social media marketing, hit up our case studies at wingnutsocial.com, check out our reviews. Uh, we do an excellent job. We are the best, the absolute best what we do and we focus on you guys. So um, I say that with a lot of pride and no humility. <laughs> okay, guys, if you're if you're here on this webinar, please share to your stories that you're here so we can see who's joining us. Tag Wing at Social, tag at the Freshmaker Design, which is Stacy Martin's uh, Instagram account, so we can we can see who's here and we will share. We will share to our stories as well. And a uh, couple things there, it's fun and it will help you to gain reach and traction for your Instagram account. So we're, we're super, super happy to do that. Uh, a couple of things. Hey, hey, Christ Christine, hi, I'm glad you can make it. Um, if you have a question about the, the presentation, which you will, uh, make sure to save those for the end. Or they'll be answered at the end, I should say, but don't put them in the chat. Put them in the question and answer section so none of them get lost. We can make sure that we get to all of those. Um, a couple, a little bit of housekeeping before I tell you a little bit about Stacy Martin. I, I wanted to let you guys know that Wingnut Social uh, Academy. <laughs> is almost getting launched here. We are looking for a beta launch. Thank you, Alicia. We're looking for a beta launch in uh, late April, early May. And our very first course is going to be Instagram for interior designers, beginner to intermediate, followed up by an advanced course. So if you are interested in finding out when that launches, head on over to wingnutsocial.com slash Wingnut Academy to sign up to get notifications for that. We are having a contest on our Instagram account at Wingnut Social, go figure. And uh, three designers, three interior designers are going to receive that course for free. So be sure to follow us and stay tuned to see how uh, that's going to happen over there. Okay, and um, all right, so I think I've covered any of the housekeeping. If you have, if you don't listen to the podcast, Wingnut Social Podcast, uh, get on over. Listen to that on uh, anything that you listen to your podcast on. Okay, you guys are in for a treat. Stacy Martin, I don't know if you heard her episode, number 250. It was a very, very uh, well-received episode. She, she knows her stuff, and I'm telling you, if you're doing your designs, your design presentations, and you're getting pushback, you're getting revisions, or they're saying, no, I don't like that, I don't like that, you know, give me something else. This is going to change, this is going to be life-changing for you and your business. It, you'll see. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not blowing smoke up your place. <laughs> so let me tell you a little something about Stacy Martin. Stacy Martin is the owner and principal designer of The Freshmaker, a full-service interior design studio that creates bespoke, casual, cool spaces for New Englanders who dare to be different. Before beginning a career in interior, Stacy cut her teeth in a variety of corporate design positions, from trend forecasting to art direction. It was there that she learned the power of brand storytelling and design narrative and uses that methodology in every space she creates. As she tells her clients, you don't have a style, you have a story. Wingnuts, let's welcome Stacy Martin to the webinar. Yeah. I know that there's a standing ovation happening right now. Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> I'm so excited to be here with all of you guys. And many of you have reached out to me on Instagram with your questions that you wanted covered in the webinar today. So hopefully um, you'll find it super informative. 
fun, uh, educational, all that good stuff. So uh, without further ado, let me get this presentation going and we can jump right in. All right. Can everybody see this okay? All right. Yes, we can see it. Okay, great. Awesome. Well, as Darla mentioned, I began my design career in the corporate world. And something of note there, um, what I experienced there is that people in really high leadership positions weren't necessarily creatives or had necessarily, hadn't necessarily come from a creative background. So in order to get the design ideas approved, to, to get people who aren't necessarily creative to understand the creative process, I had to learn to approach design presentations from more of a, a business perspective and explain why the design process was valuable and explain why that idea was valuable and was the, the right choice for the company. So that's how I, I came to this methodology of this presentation, and I'm really excited to share it with you guys today. So to start, what do Freshmaker presentations consist of? TFM is my super cool, uh, shortened acronym for the Freshmaker, by the way. Um, fun fact about me, I am a certified snowboarding instructor. And when I underwent the certification, we were taught that students or people in general need to learn, they learn best one of three ways. They either learn best hearing something, by seeing something or by doing the thing. And so when I would teach snowboarding, I would first explain what we were going to do so people could hear it. Then I would do the thing so they could see it. And then I would help them, coach them to do it themselves. So I took that methodology as well into the way that I present to clients because again, people retain information in different ways. So what does that mean? That means that we have a digital presentation, which we do on site, and that covers the hearing and the seeing. And then we have a flat lay, which um, they can interact with, they can touch, they can put things together, and that kind of allows them to do the design. So we do all of those things on site now when, um, we were in COVID, we would have the digital presentation over Zoom, and then I would deliver the flat lay to the client's home, let them interact with it for a day or two, and then I would go back and retrieve it. So it's so much nicer now to be able to do the presentations on site. And you can take the flat lay right into the room that you're working on, and it's really helpful for clients to experience that that way. So the digital presentation. Let's talk about decks, baby. Let's talk about you and me. We're going to talk about a step-by-step -step on how we do the digital presentation. Step one, create your template. This sort of seems like a no-brainer, but why is it important? Number one, the template allows you to showcase your professionalism, and it allows you to not have jumping bean screens. What is a jumping bean screen? It's when you toggle back and forth between screens in your presentation and things are jumping around and it looks kind of unprofessional. The reality is you're about to ask someone for a honk and check at the end of your presentation. So you wanna do everything in your power to build trust, to build your credibility, and to showcase your professionalism throughout the entire process so that when you get to the end and you ask them for that check, they're not nervous about it. They have seen you from start to finish showcase how professional you are and they're ready to go, ready to give you that check. So what do we include in our template? Number one is the branding and branding, if it hasn't been something you've focused on yet in, uh, in your business, I highly recommend starting to think about your branding, having a logo and having a word mark, which is a fancy term for some stylized text that can represent your business in an artistic way. 
having those two items available to use on all of your marketing materials and your social media will really help, again, showcase the professionalism of your brand and your business. So we always have the branding on our template somewhere. Ours is front and center, but you can have it you know, anywhere that, that speaks to you. The second thing we have is the presentation type in the room. So in this instance, we're looking at the mood board and the room is the sitting room. If we were looking at the floor plan or the full design plan, it would say design plan, sitting room, floor plan, sitting room, et cetera. And then we have the project name. This is really important. It's small, it's a small feature in the corner, but it's important because it feels, makes the client feel like you're catering to them. This is just for them. You're not showing everyone the same design plan. You're not showing everyone um, all the same mood boards. You're catering specifically to them and it's tailored to who they are. And then the option number or the name of the option, and then the description and the estimated costs. So um, what goes in that last area kind of depends on what it is we're showing. So on this example with the mood board, we name the mood boards because even the names should tie back into the story that you've created with your client. So in this case, it's the gray Gatsby. They were super into the great Gatsby. That was the theme for their wedding. Um, they're really into music. They play piano, they um, play guitar. They have a big record collection. So we did a fusion, a fusion of the gray Gatsby and the Moody Music Room. So if this were the design plan, instead of the description, it would say the estimated cost and what is in what is and is not included. So of note, the descriptors really matter. So make sure somewhere, whether it's an, a page all on its own or it's under the mood board, like I've shown you earlier, the descriptors matter because they they present the client with valuable insight once your meeting is over and they are reviewing without you. So when I finish presenting the design plan, we create a PDF and we send it over to the client that afternoon, that evening when we return to the office, because it's a lot of information to take in. And sometimes it's hard for people to make a decision about what they want to do right then and there. They need to digest it a little bit, which is totally normal. So while they're doing that, you want to make sure that the intention behind your design is still obvious and you want to make sure that they still understand what it was that you were trying to communicate. So make sure you have a descriptor somewhere in there that enhances that story you're trying to tell them. So step two, build the pages. So what pages are in our design presentation? The first page, again, it seems obvious, but a lot of people seem to skip this one, is cover page. The cover page is a great area to land on. When I go into a client's home, I set up my presentation. I have some sparkling apple cider and I set up the, my computer and it's showing the cover. Then that way there's nothing else that the clients can react to or start to formulate an opinion about before I've started the meeting. That way I'm totally in control of what I'm showing them and when. And this again, sets the tone for what is about to come. It helps build the anticipation and lead into the good stuff. So the cover page is your polished lead in. Let it showcase your professionalism. Make sure it looks nice. Make sure it's a little bit flashy so that, you know, you start off with a bang. What's on my cover page? Again, we have the branding. We have the project name because you want to make sure you're showcasing, you know, that the pro this is the project for them. We have, what are we talking about today? We're talking about your full design plan. What space are we talking about? We're talking about your sitting room. And what are the qualifying keywords? So this is something that I do that I have found very valuable throughout my design career. The qualifying keywords are three to four words that you come to an agreement with your client on that act as the filter for the project. 
So for example, your clients on Pinterest and they find uh, an image of something and it doesn't really work, it's very easy to explain to them why that um, side direction isn't going to work. You can say, hey, Susan McNuggs, um, you know, we're really looking to do, you really wanted a sophisticated, moody and timeless space as your end goal for this sitting room. And this um, giant wall mural of dogs playing poker doesn't necessarily hit those three keywords, but maybe we can put it in the garage. So another question that I, I got asked is how many spaces do we present when we present the design plan? It's a really great question. There is a lot of different thoughts behind that. In my experience, I have found that too much design information can um, cause decision fatigue and sticker shock. So I like to show one to three spaces. The spaces that we show, if we, if we show multiples at a time, are spaces that are connected visually or connected physically in some way, because those you want to design together, because obviously the design of one space will inform the design of the other. For example, I have a client right now, we're working on their entire first floor. And instead of showing the entire first floor at once, we are showing them a couple of spaces at a time and working through. And we've also established with the client their order of priority. So let's say they want to host Thanksgiving this year, then perhaps the dining room is on the top of their priority list. So we go through spaces in that order based on what they've told us. And again, I found it's much, much easier to get um, buy-in and approval when there's less, literally less to buy in on and less to approve. All right, the bad and the ugly. So now uh, we are showing the before. And we're starting with where we are, we're starting with what the asks are, and we're starting with all the pain points. So recount in detail all the pain points and all of the asks. Got to take a quick sip of water, hold on. <clears throat> so we would say Sam and Susan McNuggets. This is where we're at. You know, you're, you feel that your sitting room is much too formal. It's not elevated in the way that you want. It feels stuffy compared to your personalities. You're a young, fun couple. You want a room that reflects that about you. You hate the color yellow. So this is not doing any favors for you since it's very, very yellow. It's also the room that you see first from the front door and you en entertain a lot. So when you walk in the front door, you're looking for a space with some wow factor. That's inviting, that's cool. That functions really well as a place to have quiet cocktails when the kids are asleep and a place that you can invite friends over and make them feel like they're in a cool bar and um, in a cool elevated space you know, something like that, kind of walk them through what you have agreed upon are the issues with the space. So then you move into the third page, dream a little dream, which is the mood board page. So here we say, okay, you know, these were the asks, you've walked through what they want their space to, what the issues they're having with their space. And now you're talking through what they want it to become. And you walk through each of those inspiration images and reiterate the stylistic takeaways. So it's not enough just to show them, here's your mood board. You wanna walk through all the images and remind them why they were chosen because this is where you start with the, telling the story, right? So we would show them, we're taking you from where we've, we've seen where we are. Now, this is where we wanna go. The gray Gatsby, where blacks, grays, and almost black greens mix with brass and assorted shiny metals to create a loungy adult space as perfect for entertaining as it is for casual cocktails. If we look at the image in the upper left-hand corner, all of the furniture is arranged conversationally with lots of saturated earth tones 
It creates a really nice, cozy, yet elevated atmosphere. I could see you playing games right on that ottoman and drinking some Manhattans. We know that the fireplace needs an upgrade image to the bottom left and the image in the middle. Both had some dark veining on the marble that we really gravitated toward, which we thought would really elevate your space. And then the image on the right was another conversational furniture arrangement, but this time with a sofa and two chairs versus four chairs. So ultimately, a cozy elevated space with some hints of saturated earth tones to really bring it all the way home. Of note, this is also something I always like uh, I wanted to mention. So when we're talking about the mood board, the clients have already seen it. They've already approved it. So we're just, again, kind of telling the story and bringing them, um, reminding them about the story and bringing them on the journey. So to begin a project, we start with a collaborative Pinterest board and we talk about things that are pinned on there and why. And then we get all hands in the middle on the direction we're gonna go. And we create a final mood board for aesthetic approval before we begin work on the design plan. So they would have approved that mood board that you just saw already, but um, it's great again to walk them through the approval process and um, why we approved all the things that they are looking at. All right, now we're on to the floor plans. So when you get to the floor plans, explain why the new flow is wavy. So wavy, if you don't know, is cool kids slang for cool and awesome. So show the options side by side and talk about what's new, why this floor plan is the right solution for them, et cetera, et cetera. So I would say, Sam and Susan, you can see in option one, we have four chairs arranged centrally around the fireplace. And on the perimeter of the room, we've moved in your piano. We have a very cool console for your record nook and we have a space to play the guitar. And then that way you can come in on the perimeter, you set the music and then you enter into the center of the space and cozy up by the fire and play your games. Option two, very similar setup. The difference in this one is that there is a sofa and two chairs like we saw in the mood board. And the bench has been moved over under the window to give someone a spot to read a book or if people want to play games in the middle and some people wanna move away and have a conversation with their cocktails, they can do that as well. So we just talk through why, again, why the floor plan is the way that it is and how it's similar and how it's different. Then the fish, fifth page is the encore. So I like to show the bad image, the bad image, the, let's say the before image, because not, not everyone's before picture is bad per se, but I like to show the before picture one more time so that there's a really juicy before and after. So we would say something like, all right, Sam and Suze, just one last time, this is where you are, dated, not inviting, stuffy, too formal, and we can't wait to take you from this to this. Boom. Now we're at the reveal. This is the part that they've been waiting for, very excited, and you can see now we've talked about, okay, we've set it up, the qualifying keywords, we know where we want to end up, and then we know start with the, the before image, we've walked them through, and now we're at the reveal. So at the reveal, let your clients fall in love with the story of their life. How do we do that? We start by telling them the story of how they're going to use the space. So for example, I would say, now this is your new space. Imagine coming down after the kids are asleep, the fire is going, the lights are dimmed. Sam, you sit on the bench and you add a couple of logs to the fire. Susie, you sit down in the armchair and swivel around so that you can talk to Sam. 
Sam gets up, you put a record on the record player, your favorite song is playing, and you talk about all the different things that you did for the day because the children are asleep and you can now have a linear conversation. <laughs> You know, and then we move them through how how the space, you know, is used via a story and kind of get them to imagine, yeah, yes, at the end of the day, I can totally see myself coming in there, swiveling in the chair, putting my feet up, having someone bring me a cocktail, et cetera, et cetera. So we start again by telling the story. Then we get a little bit into how each item reinforces that story. So what does that mean? In this particular instance, we would say something like, and Suze, as you're sitting there, you notice the black and gold on the chairs and the black and gold on the fireplace. And it brings you back to your wedding because black and gold were your wedding colors. And as you look around, you notice the French marble on the fireplace and the European style oversized mirror. And it reminds you of your honeymoon to Paris. As you continue to look around, you notice the olive tree in the corner, which is the symbol of peace and friendship. And it just makes you feel all cozy knowing how much fun you're going to have with your friends in that room, etc. Talk about you know, how each thing relates back. We, we did that, that is a real example. We did actually choose the black and gold because it represents um, their wedding colors and it's a color pairing that's really special to them. So it's just an underlying thing that, it, you know, they know is there. It's not obvious to other people, but it just makes the room even more special. Talking point number two, how does each piece support another? This is really important as well because, um, some people had mentioned to me earlier that they'll present a furniture plan and the client will purchase like one or two things, but not the collective. So this is a really important point you want to make. You want to make sure you tell them why the collective is valuable. And it's not just about individual pieces that each piece in there supports the other piece. And without one, the whole thing topples down just like a Jenga game. So for example, we would say something like, if you look at the black chairs on the right, they're balanced on the left by, it's not in the rendering, but the black piano and the black accent chair. And then the dark of the fireplace is balanced on the other side with the dark of the record credenza. So now you have these sets of black, all around the room that make it feel balanced and make it feel sophisticated. The fluting on the coffee table mirrors the fluting on the side table and both of those mirror the fluted detail that's going above your fireplace. So again, those elements really repeat around the room and make everything feel cohesive. All of the elements have a curved back. So together they create a cozy conversational environment that's perfect for spending time with your friends. And the green of the chair balances out the green of the plant and the green of the carpet or the rug. And then talking point number three, when it comes to the budget, I state the overall budget and not how much each individual item costs. This is because in my experience, people have different ideas of perceived value. So some person might think $5,000 is totally reasonable to spend on a chandelier, but they might think $2,000 is outrageous to spend on an area rug and someone else may feel the reverse to be true. So I have found that if we work together with the clients and throughout the discovery process and throughout the design planning process, we will have honed in on a general target area. So if we're just in that range for the budget, then it doesn't really necessarily matter to them at the, this point if the rug is really expensive and the light fixture is uh, more affordable or vice versa, because now they're focused on the overall story. The other thing um, we will have discussed with them is areas to splurge and to save. So again, that also reinforces 
the idea that we're going to splurge for this room on light fixtures. We know that you have a young dog who may damage the rugs. So we're gonna save on the rugs for this one. And then when the dog gets bigger, then we can upgrade your rugs to something a little bit more extravagant. So if you look in the upper left of this uh, design plan image, you'll see that it has the option number and I name each option to the cozy conversational and then um, whatever option two is, it's something else. So a lot of names, a lot of storytelling, everything that can support the story does. Um, and then it says the estimated cost. So I would say, okay, after I've walked them through the story and I've walked them through option one, I would say, okay, um, you know, this is option one, cozy conversational. The estimated cost for option one is 18.9, excluding shipping, handling, and whatever work the trades need to do around the fireplace. And then I would move on to option two. And then if they want to look at things more closely, I use my DOMA and they can go in to the proposals in their um, project portal. And then they can look at the things individually. But I also turn off the um, availability for the client to, like there's a purchase online where they can click on a website and go online to look at the item. I turn that off because that also makes you more valuable to the client. If they're like, oh, well, I'll just, I can click on that and see that this particular chair is from abcchairs.com. So I can just buy it myself later or something like that. So if you turn that off, I have found that, um, you know, now they're relying on you even more to deliver that furniture because they don't know where it's from and they don't know how to source it on their own. But they are able to look at it more closely, look at the materials more closely through my DOMA and then see what each individual item costs. Now presenting the options. So option one and option two. How do we do that? I 99% of the time will present two options, even if I know which option the client is going to pick, because I have found in my experience, clients feel more comfortable. It makes them feel more in control to be able to, to have the options and to be able to choose versus like, here you go, what do you think? Um, I will present one option if it's a client I've worked with in the past. I really know their design style. They're like, whatever, you just tell me what it should be. Um, especially if when you show them the mood board, they're like, yes, we want, we love the image in the middle. Like that's our dream bathroom. Then you know that if that's the dream bathroom, then you only need to present one option that feels like that. So present the two options. I don't do them side by side just because there isn't actually that enough room to see details. So I'll do the one and then I'll, I'll present the second one. Create cousins, not strangers. This is really important. Um, this is kind of my hack to revisions if there is an event that I will need revisions. And what does that mean? So if you look at option one and you look at option two, they're not super different. They are a little bit different, but one isn't like modern farmhouse and one art deco. They're in the same zone. They just have a little bit of a different layout, a little bit of a different furniture choice. And I lead the witness on this when I present and I say, okay, I'm gonna, here's option one. Uh, don't worry if you like something from option two because the options are designed to work together. So we can mix and match if there's something in another option that you like better and you wanna see pulled into option, the option one or option two. And then that way, if you lead the witness on that, then if you do end up having a revision, 99% of the time the revision is, oh, can you, can we have the, two of the green chairs in, in option two instead of two of the black chairs. And then it's what you've already done the work. So your revision is what, 30 seconds? And then you just boop, 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 update it and send them the revised design plan for approval. So that's why I like to say, show options that are cousins, not strangers. And then lastly, never show a no-no. This one gets me. So I have worked with other designers in the past where they love a certain option and they're like, I, I 
I know they're going to choose option two, I love option two. So I'm going to show them option one, an option that's terrible because there's no way they would ever pick it. It would force them to pick option two. Well, guess what, Buttercup? Not everybody has great taste, which is why they hired you. So somebody's going to pick that terrible option number one, and then you're stuck with your name on it and you can't photograph it and it's embarrassing. And then they're going to show all of their friends who are either going to want more of it, which is not going to work out well for you, or they're going to think like, wow, I can't believe she hired a designer and she got that thing. So never show anything that you wouldn't want to put your name on. If you have one option over another that you think is better for them, tell them so and say, we think solution two is perfect for your space, but really it's all about you and you, know, you choose what works best for you. But don't ever show one that's bad because Newton's law, they will pick it. So uh, that is what our digital presentation consists of. So once we finish the digital presentation, I pivot over and now I'm with the client and we're looking at the flat lay. So what is the flat lay? For me personally, I order these really cool um, white acrylic trays. They're big. They're like um, 20 like 18 by 20 or something. They're really big white acrylic trays. And I cut a little piece of white foam and I put it in the bottom and that those are my flat lays. And then I fill them full of all of the things that are going to create this visual story that are going to enhance the visual story. So I have the obvious things like the tile sample, the countertop, the hardware sample, et cetera, et cetera, the cabinet. But then I also include things that maybe you wouldn't expect. I always include some kind of greenery that's in our intake form. How do you feel about live plants? Most people say yes. Um, and live plants in a space, just take it up a notch. So always put some kind of greenery in there. In this instance, um, there we were proposing a vintage like glass science cabinet and in the science cabinet are all these different baskets and so one of the baskets has a little leather um, handle on the top and so the basket lid goes in there the towels go in there the if i can't get a swatch of the rug then i'll print out a picture of the rug and mat it on a um, kind of heavyweight piece of white cardboard so that it kind of holds its own against the other heavier swatches that are on there. I'll print out the artwork and do the same thing there. I'll include a scented candle, just like a little one, but something that, again, enhances that story. If someone's super into boho or something, maybe I'll include a patchouli candle, something like that, you know, just to really enhance the story. And the candle's not lit, by the way, because we don't want anyone's sleeves or hair to catch on fire. It's just there to kind of be part of enhancing the experience. I'll have crystals in there. I, I'm a hippity dippity person through and through. So I do like to decorate with crystals for my clients. I'll have that. I'll have sage bundles, literally all the things, anything you can think of. And even um, I've used jewelry in the past. If the sample of the brass or um, the metal that I want to use um, is portrayed more nicely on a bracelet, for example, than a little swatch metal swatch, I'll use a bracelet. Just stuff that's fun to interact with because it's really fun for the client to get to kind of paw through this stuff and put it all together and um, just really experience what the design would feel like for them in that space. So this just kind of enhances what I just said, include any and all elements that continue to enhance your story, all the things as much as you can. Um, and each room should have its own little tray um, with all the elements on it makes it really easy to move from space to space. So you have your um, presentation cover page up, you have your flat lay, you're kind of adjusting it as the clients are getting settled and pouring their sparkling apple cider. Um, and then there you have it. You have a really nice experience for you and the clients and you get your A plus two thumbs up design plan. 
So um, I really wanted to thank all of you guys for coming. We're gonna get to questions in a minute, but I know that some of you had messaged me as well about um, mentoring or doing some coaching on your client presentation. So I wanted to say that if that's something you're still interested in, please send me a DM on Instagram at the Freshmaker Design. And I would love to set up a time one-on-one -on -one to chat with you and to help you with what you need because this community has helped me with what I need um, many, many times. And so it's awesome. And so I wanna do the same. Awesome. Thank you so much, Stacy. I, I told you guys, I mean, we have so many comments in the chat, like, this is amazing. Carl. This is <laughs> terrific. We have questions. We have, if you uh, asked your question in the chat, um, Alicia is going to try to pick those up and, and ask those as well. But let's start with the, the questions in the Q&A. If you have any, very welcome, Fran. Oh, hi, Fran. Hi, Darlene. Hi, Holly. Holly, hey, good to see you. Um, good to see everybody here. Let's see. Let's start with the, the questions. Melinda was very, very prolific. <laughs> <laughs> she asked some good ones. So Melinda Sims, the first question, uh, do you recommend portrait or landscape presentations? Oh, that's a great question. I do landscape because that's what looks great on my Mac. I use, oh, I forgot to mention this actually. I use oh. Keynote for my presentations. So um, you can create a template right in Keynote and then duplicate the slide. That's key, duplicate the slide. Don't copy and paste anything because that way you make sure that everything's always in the same place. Um, and the Keynote uh, templates are in landscape, so. Good, 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 good. Kimberly Richmond has a, a lengthy question, but here we go. She understands why you break up the presentation into smaller groups, but she's working with a client that's building a new home and she was brought in to furnish the whole home. Her question is, um, they are coming to this house with zero, nothing, not a zilch, and not even a Tupperware bowl. <laughs> <laughs> Funny, that's good. Um, so they need everything immediately. How would you present something as overwhelming? Is that? that that's a great question i'm actually working with a client uh in exactly the same boat it's a new build uh out of state and um we're doing exactly the same thing from the soup to nuts from the ground up so i do the same process i'll just show them a little bit at a time so for example there's a first floor and there's a loft space so we'll start with um, in, our, in this instance, we started with kitchens and bathrooms because some of it depends on the selections that need to be made earlier in order for the contractor to be able to continue with the build. So that's how I decided which ones we were going to do first. So we did kitchens and baths together, bedrooms together, loft space together, living room together. Um, also dependent upon what items are historically having longer lead times and things, I might switch that around. Um, but it's not like I'm gonna show you this and we're gonna wait a week and then we're gonna do it again. It's like, okay, today we're gonna do this. Tomorrow we're gonna do that, you know? So it's still little bites, but it's just, it would be kind of like having a five course meal instead of an all you can eat buffet. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Yeah. Love it. Uh, Melinda, again, do you show the old existing floor plan and why that didn't work? That's a good question. I don't. And the reason that I don't do it is purely because I don't want the client to have to spend money on me taking the time to create an old floor plan that I'm just going to redo. redo. So instead, in, in the instance I showed, it was kind of easy because there wasn't any existing furniture in the old space, but let's say there was, I would just talk through the old floor plan. I would say, previously your sofa was over here and X, Y, Z, this is why it didn't work instead of kind of showing the visual. Oh, awesome. Cheryl Kinsey says, where do you get your trays for your flat lays? Amazon.com. <laughs> <laughs> I used to get them from West Elm. Prime, was that? Oh, no. I no, don't, not too expensive. Too expensive. Yeah. yeah. So you do have to, they have a lot of like lookalikes. So sometimes I'll purchase the tray. I'll go to purchase again 
and it's like $40 when I paid 25 last time or something. So you can just like search similar and just buy it from somebody else who has it much cheaper, but I get it from Amazon. If you just search like white, white dining tray, I think, like I said, I think it's like 18 by 20 or something. It's a big tray. That is big. Yeah, that is a really big. Darlene yep. Hall hyphen Barrett. Not sure if someone asked already. I don't think they did. How are you charging to do the presentation? Maybe you're going to go over this as well. Yes, you are right now. I am. <laughs> so when I include, so when I meet with a client, um, before we do project kickoff, I will send them a project estimate. And in my estimate, I will break it out and I will include this as I call this a site visit. So I will call it, um, you know, how at X, I need X number of site visits. And so this will be one of those included in there. And then I also include my drive time. So if somebody who lives an hour away from me, they're going to pay more for their des- design presentation than somebody who lives five minutes away. That makes perfect sense. So this is a kind of a combo question. We had a couple of pricing questions. One is, do you show your pricing on the presentations? And um, I just totally lost my train of thought. Okay, well, let's, let's just answer that one. Do you show your pricing on the presentation? Oh, the other one was, do you include your designer pricing on the presentations? Oh, good question. I do not include my designer pricing on the presentation. I only include the ff and um, and I can kind of show you where it is real okay. quick. So right here, um, it's underneath the option, the estimated cost. And I always say estimated cost because sometimes someone um, might want to change a fabric, which is an upcharge, or there might be a, an additional shipping and handling charge, um, different things like that, especially when it comes to, to the trades and stuff like that. There might be a, an unforeseen cost. So I always say estimated cost, but I do list it up, up in the design plan option. Awesome. Another combo question. What software are you using for the mood boards and the renderings? Um, For the renderings, I actually am using Photoshop. Mm -hmm. Um, And for the mood mood board, I am using Adobe Illustrator, but you could use Canva. You could use um, Photoshop as well if if you're good with Photoshop. Um, For me, the secret though is to make sure everything is evenly spaced. So that's my kind of insider trick on making sure your mood board looks pro. Awesome. Holly Pecora is asking, how do you close at the end, I suppose? Yeah. So I walked through the two options and then we go to the flat lay and then I'll say something like, I know it's a lot of information to take in at one time, but I hope you're as excited about this transformation as I am. I can't wait to see what this new room is, how it's gonna function for you guys. I'm going to go back to the studio and give you some time to um, think about this and to really interact with the different choices. And then I'll circle back with you tomorrow and we can talk about next steps. So I just sort of like say to them, like, I totally get that it's a lot of info. I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna leave you. You can, ha- you can have the sparkling apple cider, do your thing. I'm going to send you the PDF so you can review it again on your own, but I'm going to, I'm going to touch base with you right away again tomorrow. Awesome. Uh, Andrea Durchik, I'm sorry if I'm, I'm messing up your last name, but she says, how much time would you have in between each presentation if you have a whole home you're designing? Yeah. Again, that kind of depends on like the build schedule, um, when lead, like what the lead times are for the different things and when things need to be ordered. So I would expect if we're presenting a whole home that it would be done, the presentations would be done within one and a half to two weeks tops. Or you could even do a week if you're, you know, if it's, if time is of the essence. Um, But again, with the example of my clients building the vacation home, we're doing a presentation like every other day because it gives them a time to see the presentation, to sit with it, digest it. If there is something they want to change, you know, we have time for that and then we move on. Okay, cool. Darlene Hall Barrett again. So you have basically worked out a flat rate to prepare the presentation and the items included question mark. Essentially, like I know, I do know how long it takes me. It it generally takes me a couple of hours to just do this part. Um, 
it's not a flat rate because I do charge hourly. So if, if the room is larger um, and I need to compile more information or if there are more spaces that I need to show, then you know I will bill hourly for that based on the time that it takes me. But the flat rate comes into play specifically when it's just a site visit because I know I'm going to be there for about an hour and I know my drive time is X. And so I can tell them that's going to cost this part. Um, but I do bill um, monthly with an hourly rate. So I don't know if that answers your question or not. I have a question for you. Do you get any pushback on the drive time billing? No, I haven't. Yeah, yeah. I always, I was always, always uh, English. I was always hesitant <laughs> to charge for the drive time. I don't know why. So I made it up in other areas. You know, I just thought, yeah. uh, I like that you itemize it. I mean, it is what it is, yeah. right? Yeah, I do. I should clarify though. I do only charge for one way mm -hmm. because then it does get expensive. Like I want people, I love designing your vacation home, but it's out of state. So it's going to take me an hour and a half to drive there. So, you know, that's kind of a bummer if you're paying me three hours of design fees just to listen to, Wing that social podcast while I'm driving. <laughs> Money so. well spent. Well spent. Coca so Connect. Oh, sorry. Oh, I was just gonna say I do bill um one way. But I, I have heard I think I've heard other designers that do the same. Coco Kanakis is asking, what do you leave with the client once you're out of there? Like when the when the whole thing is over or just for the design? After the presentation, are you leaving them any hard copies? Are you giving them or anything to sit with? What are you leaving them? Yeah, so I send them a hard copy digitally. So I, what you just saw will go to their inbox in the form of a PDF that they can then scroll through. Um, but I don't really leave them anything physical except the little bottle of bubbly that I bring um, for the presentation. <laughs> That's nice, I like that. That's a nice touch. Sophia yeah. Zimmerman says, what if a client says I like this, but I wanna see more options for various pieces of furniture? Oh, yowza. Well, Generally, I would start by trying to get her to identify the why behind those options, because sometimes people have a knee jerk reaction to something and they think more options are going is going to satisfy that when really it just might be um, some a small tweak like a fabric change or a color change it doesn't necessarily have to be scrap the whole thing and you know show me five more living rooms go. Um, but that doesn't, that doesn't really happen using the process that we use because the mood board is approved at the beginning. So they know their design plan. They know what their design plan is going to look like. It's going to look like that mood board. So it really helps make sure. Um, so again, I would work with the client to be get her to articulate what it is that she doesn't like if it's a price point thing um what i i usually like to use words like are you able to kind of hone in on what it is you're reacting to or what what you're responding to or or what doesn't resonate with you and i try to get them to say it. and then a lot of times it'll be something that's an easier fix does that make Love sense it. This is also a kind of a combo question. Uh, what do you say when they want it itemized after the fact? I, I'm sure that you're following up with some kind of documentation to that extent as you go. Yep, so they can see the itemization in my Doma Studio on their own. They can log into their client portal and it'll show the total. So I do option one and option two in my Doma as two separate proposals. If you're not doing my Doma, you, could do it in like an Excel spreadsheet or um, some kind of like a Word doc or something that showcases the image and then what it costs and, and kind of go through there. But in my Doma, it's great because they can um, approve the whole plan. They can approve with changes, that sort of thing. And it shows them the total at the top and then what each item costs below. Awesome. Alicia, did you have any um, any straggling questions over there in the chat? Yes. So, um, we had a question asking, uh, where you get the photos you use, are they from your own portfolio or are they from, or where are you getting them for the mood board? Yep. That's a great question. So a lot of times, um, Dr. Google helps me out again. Um, that's, that's mostly it. Sometimes it'll be from my own, my own portfolio, but a lot of times it's like, if I need something really specific, 
I, I need to kind of search specifically for that thing. So I'll go into, I don't actually like to search in Pinterest because I feel for whatever reason, I feel like I just get too much of the same thing. So I'll go off on my own on Google and then I'll add it to Pinterest that way. Awesome. Okay. okay, so I wish we had I wish we had more time. We don't. Please be sure to take up Stacy on her offer to on DMing her at the Freshmaker Design at Instagram if you have any further questions. If for some reason you showed up to the presentation late, and you want to see the whole thing. I think Alicia is getting out the uh, the replay email either today or tomorrow, so stay tuned for that. Uh, make sure the to follow us on Instagram so you can get notifications uh, for future webinars next month's webinar i believe is is it april 26 at 11 a.m it's going to be all about google ads and that's going to be with yours truly uh, we just did a, a podcast episode on that so a lot of that lends itself to visual representation head on over to wingnutsocial.com and check out the information for that webinar thank you so much for joining us guys stacy martin you're you're the best this is so, <laughs> thank and you. you the second i had you on the podcast that this was going to be amazing and it was so thank you so much that's uh, stacy martin again of the fresh maker and that's at the fresh maker design on instagram if you aren't listening to the wingnut social podcast go check it out on whatever wherever you get your podcasts it's an interior design business and marketing plan if you need help with your social media or digital marketing wingnutsocial.com thank you so much for joining us we love you all have an amazing amazing rest of your day bye bye